All right, well, if you can turn your Bibles to John chapter 14, we're going to start there and uh, move into John 17 for the message this morning. John chapter 14. It's good to see you in church. Glad to see you here. It's a blessing. It's a blessing when you uh, have people to preach to. That's a blessing. And um, when you're, you're trying to prepare and pray and, and look for what, um, you know, what it is that God wants you to say to people to be an encouragement and a help to them. And uh, when you look out and there's nobody really there, it doesn't really feel like, I said this morning, it's like a mom preparing a meal when she slaves all day for the meal and putting everything together. And it could be a dad doing it, uh, you know, putting the meal together. And they, they get the, the, the table set, they look around and nobody's there to eat. It feels pretty rotten when you look around and you're like, man, I did all this work, nobody's there. I'm thankful for the internet, I'm thankful that we can preach and people can see from their house. i am tell you what, it's, a so, it's a so much better to look out and see smiling faces as you're, as you're preaching. After COVID, it was good to be able to see any faces, smiling or asleep or whatever, it didn't matter. <laughs> After COVID, it was just good to be able to see a face that was there on the other side. But uh, good to see you here, glad to see you here this morning. John chapter 14, verse number 1. He said, let not your heart be troubled. He said, you believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. I'm going to, to do something here. This is not, I'm not just going. I'm going to prepare something. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. Well, isn't that good news? I'm preparing a place, but I have a promise that I'm going to return. And he says, and I will receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And whether I go, you know, and the way, you know. Now, there's going to be a question here, because remember, you have to think about this. You've heard this preached many times, you forget it. But, I mean, these guys are not fully grasping the whole case, and he's trying to help them see something here. So he's telling them, listen, I'm, I'm going, but I'm going to come back. And, and where I'm going is actually preparation for you to be able to be someplace much better than this anyway. And you know the way, and he says, Thomas said to him, Lord, we know not where the dog goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh from the Father but by me. He tells him, I'm the way. And he's going to repair that way when he goes to the cross. And, uh, and then look at verse number 26. Verse number 26. He also tells him that, look, I'm going to go, but, and when I finally go away, I'm going to send the comfort. I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. So you're still in the same chapter, but it's verse number 26. And this is what he says. But the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. So get the picture now. He's leaving, and it's going to be a pretty, a pretty harsh thing they're about to experience with him leaving. He's going to the cross. He's making the way uh, with the truth to give them the life through the cross. And he's preparing the way for them. He's going to, he's going to come back, and, uh, and he's told them, I'm going to leave another comforter. He's been a comforter with them. I'm leaving another comforter. I'm leaving the Holy Spirit with you, the Holy Ghost. And He's going to teach you all things, and He's going to bring to remembrance the things that I've said to you so that we can get you through the things you're going to be going through in life. Look at chapter number 15. Look at verse number 17 of chapter 15. He said, These things I command you that you love one another. He just got through talking about them being friends, and they're going to need each other. He's going to be a comforter, but they're going to need each other too. And then verse number 17 there, He says, These things I command you that you love one another. Watch what He says. If the world hate you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If ye were of the world, the world would love his own, but because you're not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. That's what he's saying to them. Think about the context of what he's saying. He's saying, I'm going to go away, and it's going to be the cross. It's going to be a pretty, pretty gruesome thing, but I'm sending a comforter to you to get you through it. The, the Holy Spirit is going to lead you in the truth. He's going to bring remembrance to all things you need to, to, to hear. And by the way, understand this. They hated me, and this world you're in right now that you're not of, but you're in it, they're going to hate you. Well, that's comforting. Chapter 16. Chapter 16 and verse number 33. These things I have spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. It's about to get bad, but you can have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. I'm going to talk to you this morning a little bit about the world and the church. And if you're saved today, you're part of the church. But you know what you are? You're living inside a world. You're living in the world. 
And what he's told them is the same thing we're learning this morning that God's actually telling us in the same sense is that he's gone, he's gone to prepare a place for us and there's no other way to get there. I don't care what Oprah has said or anybody else has ever said, there's only one way to get to the Father and that is through the Son. Through the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. There is only one way. Not multiple ways. There's only one way to get there. There's not many good ways. There's only one true way to get to the life. And that's who Jesus Christ. And that's what he's done. And he said this, I'm going, I'm going to repair a place. I'm, I'm going through the way to make the way so that now anybody can come, the whole world can come, and then I'm going to come back. And we're looking forward to that day, praise the Lord, that he's going to come back and receive us unto himself that where he is, there we may be also. But along the way, you know what he told you? He said, you're going to have trouble. Don't get too overwhelmed by the trouble. He's overcome the world. And he's given you something to get you through some of this. He's given you the Holy Spirit. Now, what he's also given you is his words. And he said, the Holy Spirit's going to work together with the words, and it's going to bring remembrance, everything I've told you, to comfort you. Remember when he told him in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 that there's coming a day that, that they're going to hear a trumpet, and the Lord's going to come back in the air, and we're going to be caught up together with him. And he says this, comfort one another with these words. He's given us his word, and he's given us his spirit to get us through this, but it doesn't change the fact that in this world, we're going to have tribulation. When you get to chapter 17, chapter 17 is a fantastic chapter. I mean, really it is. It's Jesus Christ praying. And all of it is really good, but I just want to zoom in on verse number 11 down to verse number 23. I want you to see something this morning that I hope will be a real help to you. John chapter 17 and verse number 11. He's praying praying all through this. In this chapter, he mentions the word world. I don't know. I don't think I have it written in here. Somebody else may have it. I don't know. It seems like it's like 20-something times maybe. But in verse number 11, he says, And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world. His disciples, the ones he's left here, he says, I'm no longer in the world. I'm going to be going, but these are in the world. And I come to thee, Holy Father, Keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me I have kept, and none of them is lost but the son of perdition, that the scriptures might be fulfilled. And now I come, come I to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves." I have given them thy word, here it is, the word, and the world hath hated them because they are not of the world. When you become a child of God, you know what you are? You're in this world, but you're not of this world. He says, even as I am not of this world. You are of him. He just got through saying there'd be one. And Jesus is not of this world, though he was in this world. And guess what? You're in this world, but if you're in Christ, you're not of this world. Verse number 15, watch what he says. I pray not, now think about it for a minute. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world. That's a key verse for what I'm saying to this morning. You have been left here for a purpose. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world. You know what he could have done? He could have saved them and then phew, they're out of here right then. But he didn't. He left them in this world. Why? I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of this world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. You know what this world is? It's evil. It's supposed to be in this world. I'm going to show you that in a minute. Why? Verse 16. They're not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Notice what he says. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Set them aside and make them different from the rest of this world. Set them aside. That's what sanctify means. Through thy word. Uh, let them get a hold of your word so that it, it becomes so much a part of them. that they're set aside from the rest of the world, they look, act, do everything different than the rest of this world. Leave them in this world, but keep them the evil that is in this world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Watch what Jesus says. As thou hast sent me, remember he's talking to the Father, as thou hast sent me into the world, watch, this is your purpose, even so have I also sent them, where? Into the world. You're not, you're not supposed to be of the world or like the world, but we're left to be in this world, just like he was sent. Now why was he sent into this world? To reconcile lost sinners to the Father. 
Why are we left in this world? Same purpose. Verse 19. And for their sakes I sanctify myself that they also might be sanctified through the truth. It's a great example. He, he gives the example. I've sanctified myself. I've been sent in the world. I've been sanctified, set apart to be different from the rest of this world so that I could win this world to the Father. And so now I'm sending them to the exact same thing, sanctified, set apart, sent with a message. Verse number 20. Watch what he says. This is where he's praying for you. Not just those that he said that you've given me out of this world, but he's also praying right now in this scripture, in time, in a, in a, in a, in a location, Jesus Christ was kneeling down, talking to the Father, speaking about you sitting here today. Verse number 20, Neither pray I for these, these that he's praying for right there alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. You know, that's who you are. You're somebody that has believed on Jesus Christ through the words that have been passed down over time. And now you've got a copy of their words, the same words that were spoken there. And now you become a believer. You know what you do? You give those same words to somebody else so they become a believer. He said, I'm not praying just for me alone or for these alone, but for them that shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one, even as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe. Now watch out. And he says he wants them, all these new believers, to be part of him, to be in him. Remember, he's not of this world. He's in the world. He was sent into this world. He's not of it, but he's in it. And he says, I'm going to send them into the world, not of it, but in it. And they're going to be in me, in Christ. And the whole idea behind this is that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. You know what he said of them and ultimately of you? I don't want you to save them and take them out of this world. I want you to leave them in it. You know what I want you to do? Not, I, want, I don't want you to take them out of this world. I want you to keep them away from the evil that's in this world. What I want you to do is sanctify them through thy truth. I want you to get the word in them and make them different than the rest of this world. Why? So that the rest of the world may believe that Jesus Christ did come to die on the cross for the sins of the people. That the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And the glory which thou gave me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one, I and them, and thou and me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may, what? Know. That the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. You know what he wants the world to know? That he loved them enough to come and die on the cross for their sins. Somebody says, well, I just don't know if God really loves. All you have to do to understand the love of God is look at the cross of Calvary that they've just been singing about. And so when you read this, you read about the world, and you read about the saved people, the church. And you read why he left us here. Now, when you think about the world, most people think about the world, they think about this globe. Sometimes we get the earth confused with the world. The earth is this thing we're standing on, the dirt, the mountains, the rivers, the trees, the oceans, all those things. That's the earth. The world is more of the system that is operating on top of this earth. It's the present state of existence. Some definitions, it's the present state of existence. It's mankind in general. It's the human race. It's the customs and practices of this life that we live in. It's the carnal state or corruption of the things going on on this world, as the world, as the Bible says, this present evil world. To be worldly is to uh, somebody pretending to the, a, a life that is wrapped up in this world. It's an opposition of the life to come. It's, it's, it's wrapped up in the pleasures of the things of this world system. That's what being worldly is. Let me say some things about the world, then we'll get into what you're left here for. The world has some things, same things we've got as a church. The world has a God. Did you know that? The world has its own God. The Bible says, 2 Corinthians 4, 4, In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the, God, God, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. There is a God in this world that is blinding the minds of people so that they will not see the truth. He's trying to get their eyes focused on everything but on Jesus Christ. 
He doesn't care if they're involved in churches as long as they're so busy involved in something that tells them that they can work their own way there and blind them from seeing that Jesus is the only way, truth, and the life. He's a God of this world, and He's working in this world. Somebody says, man, I, all the things that are going on in the world today, it's a crazy world that we live in. Yes, there is a crazy world that we live in. But listen, we're not of this world, we're just in this world. And we've been left here to be a light in this craziness. There's a God. 1 John 4, 3, the latter half of that says there's a spirit in this world. And it says, and this is that spirit of antichrist, meaning against Christ. Whereof you have heard that he should come, and even now already is in the world. There is a spirit at work in this world. Listen, if you're saying today we have a God, we have a spirit, the Holy Spirit of God. But in this world, they have a God, and they have a spirit. In Ephesians 2, 1, it says, And you have he quickened to were dead and trespasses and sins, where in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince and power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. You know what he said? We had a course that we were on. You know, this world is on a, if you think about a course, it's an obstacle course or a running course. They're on a course that's headed somewhere. This world is. And when you got saved, listen, you've got a brand new God, you've got a brand new spirit, and you've got a brand new course that you're on in life. I'm not going the same. Listen, when you got saved, you shouldn't be going the same direction you used to be. You've made an about face and you're going a little bit different. You're still in this world, but you're not traveling on the same track the world's traveling anymore. You're traveling in a track that's parallel to it. And they're over here looking at you going, man, you're on that train and we're still in the same directions here. We're still in the same place. But over on that train, things look a whole lot cleaner. Things look a whole lot better. Things don't seem so insane over there. There's something different about that train on just that track over there how do i get there and we say jesus is the way to this train track it's a different course it's a different way you realize that there's a different wisdom first corinthians 2 6 it says how be it we speak wisdom among them that are perfect yet not the wisdom of this world nor of the princes of this world that come to naught but we speak the wisdom of god you realize there's a different wisdom there's a different way of doing everything Education in this world is different than the education we give our children in church. Education of what they're trying to indoctrinate our children with is different than what the Bible says. Romans 1 talks about it, the fact that the people would worship the creature more than the creator. And you can see that in the day we live in, that people worship self and people worship everything else way more than they worship the God that created all these things. The Bible says, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. What kind of world system, what kind of wisdom says take Bibles out of school but give Bibles to people in prison? Does that make it, listen, that, that, that doesn't even make any logical sense, much less spiritual sense. Give them a Bible when they get to prison, but take away the Bible when they're a child learning truth. Prayer is gone, we replace it with logic and reason. There's a wisdom of this world. But this is the idea. He, God knows that. God knows that that's what this world is made up of. God knows that this world has a God, this world has a spirit, this world has a course, this world has a wisdom. And so what he has done is he sent, he, he, he pushed into this world system Jesus Christ to be something so different than the rest of this world, to turn this world upside down. And then he saved him. He, he became the way and saved sinners and brought them unto himself, and he said, now I'm going to send you into that same world. You're not going to be of it, but you're going to be in it, and you're going to turn the world upside down. And so what he did is, you know, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, what? The world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God sent not His Son in the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. You know what He sent Him in this world to do? To save sinners from hell. That's what He sent Him there for. In Galatians 1.4 it says, Who gave Himself for our sins that He might deliver us from this present evil world. 
And when you look at verse 18 down through verse number 20, you know what he did? He says, and thou hast, as thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Neither pray I for these only, but for also for them which shall believe on me through their, world, th- through their word. And then that verse I gave you in 21, that the world may believe. And at the end of 23, that the world may know. That's what you've been left here for. You have a responsibility in this world to be a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. You said, well, I, I, don't know what my, my, I don't know what my job is. I did this this morning. I was thinking about it. Somebody says, well, my occupation is whatever, a soldier. Well, let me tell you something else. If you're saved, you may have an occupation as a soldier, but according to Ephesians chapter 1, you have a vocation. A vocation and a calling is a child of God and be a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. An occupation is something you occupy while you're here, something that keeps you busy while you're here that you're doing, but your vocation trumps your occupation. Now, you may be a carpenter, you may be working and do carpentry work, and that may be your occupation, but you know what God has called you to do is to be a light in this world. So while you're swinging a hammer, you're all supposed to be a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. Doesn't matter if you're a soldier and you're marching down the road and you've got a rucksack on, that may be your occupation, but your vocation is to be a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. You may own a business, and that may be your occupation, but your vocation is to be a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what we're supposed to be doing with every breath we breathe and every day we've got is our vocation is to be a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. Occupation is what we occupy ourselves with. Vocation means you're calling. You know what you are? You're called to be a witness for the Lord. So let me make three statements here. Three statements. Here they are. What have I been left here in this world to do? What have I been left here? I mean, he, he told me, I don't, want him to, I don't want to take him out of the world. I want you to leave him in this world. What am I supposed to be doing in this world? What's my purpose as the church in this world? Three things. If you write stuff down, you might want to write this down. Here it is. Number one is this. My job is to confound the world, not conform to the world. My job is to confound the world. The world ought to look at me and say, no, there's something peculiar about that person. In 1 Corinthians 1, 27, it says, But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. It says, God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound that which is mighty. You know what God's done? He's chose us, and He chose us to live in a certain way. Sanctify them to thy truth, thy word is truth. To live in a certain way that people look at us and say, now that person is different. That person is peculiar. That person marches to the beat of a different drum. That person lives a life different than everybody else that I work with. That person acts different, talks different, does things different than everybody else. I'm not talking about being a Bible thumper we're walking around trying to beat people up with the bible but i am talking about being sanctified by the truth thy word is truth i'm talking about living a christian life that is such a real life that people see it and say you are different than everybody else i've been around you're different than everybody else in my family every one of my friends every one of my co-workers something is different about the way you live your life it ought to be confusing. I remember whenever the, the guy that led me to the Lord, Greg, when he, we did his going away uh, ceremony, and I had just been newly saved. He left right after I got led to the Lord. And I remember standing up and saying something on his behalf. And everybody knew this. Everybody said the same things about him. And I said this statement. I said, Greg Nix is a strange individual. And everybody in the whole place, we're all at a restaurant. They all laughed. And they all said, he is different. He's different than anybody I've ever been around in my entire life. I've never been around a soldier that acted the way this man acted. And I said, he's just different. When it was his turn to stand up, he stood up and said, I am a peculiar creature. I am a chosen generation. I am different. And he went through and kind of preached to everybody for a little while. It was a blessing. I remember hearing a story one time where him talking about the CID, which our motto was, seek the truth. Seek the truth. And I remember he went to a big meeting, and he was one of the guys in charge of some of the CID stuff. And they had some colonels there and different guys in a big room. And they were, I think it was in Korea, and they were 
they were standing around and, and, and talking, and one of the guys got up, and he started the whole thing off by saying, uh, I like to open it up with a joke. He, he talked about when, uh, when we all stand before the pearly gate in St. Peter, and we're going to have a shot of whiskey with each other and this and that, and he went through this joke. I don't remember what the joke was. It was just dumb. And, uh, and then all the guys would go out. They were all there without their, their spouses. All of them would go out and party afterwards and go out and get drunk. And, and it, was, it was captains and colonels and warrant officers and enlisted. All the leaders were there, and they were all doing all that stuff. And, and Greg asked, he said, at the end of all of this, he asked the guy in charge, he said, would it be possible for me to stand up and address everybody with something? Since you started off with a thing about St. Peter and us getting drunk in heaven, would it be possible for me to stand up and maybe give a different side of that? And he said, yes, but you've got to give everybody the opportunity to leave before you say it. And he said, okay. And so he got up and he said, I'd like to address everybody with our motto. Our motto is seek the truth. And I'm going to say something about the Lord. If you'd like to get up and leave, you certainly can. Well, the way it works is most people, if, if one would have gotten up, everybody else probably would have gotten up. But everybody else, nobody wanted to be the first guy. So he went right into the message and he began to tell them where the truth may be found. And it won't be found on the bottom of a bottle. It won't be found in a club. It won't be found in a strip club. It won't be found in the pleasures of life. It's found in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, everybody listened to this, and everybody thought, what an absolute moron. Why would you address this? Why would you tell us that? And he said, listen, if you're really about seeking the truth, let me tell you where the ultimate truth may be found. Now, nobody liked it. Nobody enjoyed it. Nobody thought, man, what a, what a great thing. Let's give him a round of applause. But I remember him telling the story. And I remember there was a lady outside mopping the floor out in the hallway. And she said afterwards, thank you for being an example. It encouraged me. I was out in the hallway mopping the floors. Nobody else may have got something, but I got something out of it. I talked to a guy that I worked for in CID at this office, and I said, you ever met Greg Nix? He said, yeah, I know that guy. And I said, why did you say it like that? He said, everywhere that guy went, he was a witness for Jesus Christ. He said, it got old really quick. You know what I'm telling you? We ought to be somebody that when people come around us, they may, they may leave and say, I might not have liked him. I might not have liked her. But at least they tried to live like a Christian. There's a book called Unchristian. And it says, our research discovered that 84% of young non-Christians say they know a Christian personally, yet only 15% say the lifestyle of those believers are noticeably different in a good way. You know, when I was reading, I did it in Sunday school, we read Romans chapter number 12, and it talks about be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. What do you say? Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. The renewing, changing the way you think. When you get through reading Romans chapter 12 and you read the last half of that, of Romans chapter 12, you know it talks about living a completely different life. Love. It talks about being kind. Do people say about you as a Christian, now you know they're different, they're kind. You know what? They're different, they're, they're loving. You know, it's, it's a difference. There's a difference between the way the world works. You know, the world's on a course and we're on a course. On the world's course, when somebody does something wrong to you, you know what you do? You get back at them. But you know what you do according to Romans chapter 12 with a renewed mind, a new way of thinking? Is you do good to those that treat you bad. You overcome evil with what? What do we say? Or with good. That's a different way of thinking than the way the rest of the world thinks. You know what we're supposed to do? We're supposed to confound it, not conform to it. We say the second one. He's just saying amen. He likes it. Confound it, not conform to it. Number two, let me say this. Listen real close. We're supposed to win this world, not whine about it. We've been left here to be a witness to this world. To win this world. Not war against it and throw rocks at them. We're here to win this world. Let me give you a verse. 1 Corinthians 6, verse number 9. That's where he left it. He said, I don't want you to get them in the evil. I want you to keep them from the evil, but I want them to be in this world. Why? To win over that evil. In 1 Corinthians 6, 9, it says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves of mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And we all say, amen, boy, I'm glad you, you, you mentioned all them. They're all rotten, and that's, that, that's right, that's all rotten, that's all sinful. But the next verse there that we don't quote all the time says this, And such were some of you. 
But ye are washed, but you are sanctified, but you are justified by the name of the Lord Jesus, by the Spirit of our God. You know what you are? You were just like everybody else were throwing rocks at. You were in the same boat they were in. We cannot get to the place that we sit in our nice air-conditioned church houses with our nice comfortable seats and our three-piece suits, I don't even know what a three-piece suit is, and our suits and our ties and our little hankies and our Bibles and our arms, and we stand here and throw rocks at the rest of this world that doesn't act like us or look like us or talk like us when it wasn't but just a year ago or two years ago or five years ago or ten years ago, we were exactly like them. And to be quite honest with you, underneath all this stuff, some of us inside are still exactly like them. We don't need to whine about this world. We need to go win the people of this world. We don't need to throw rocks at these people, hand gospel tracts to these people. God's left us here in this world to be a, a light in this world. Matthew 5, 13, you are not, it says, you are the salt of the earth. I heard somebody say this one time, the salt doesn't belong in the shaker. You know what you can do? You know, stacy has got salt shakers all over the house. Man, they're everywhere. They're in the, on the bar thing there. They're at the, on the table. There's some on the, on, the, on the countertop. I mean, they're everywhere. Salt shakers are everywhere. And some of them are real decorative. Some of them are just plain. I like just the plain ones that has an S or a P on the top of it so I don't accidentally put pepper on top of something that needs salt. And I like that, the, but they're, I mean, they're decorative. The pepper one, I think, has three holes, and the salt one has two holes in it, something like that. They're decorative and really nice. You know what? You know what I can say? Man, look at that beautiful salt shaker over there. Oh, it's so beautiful. I could bring people to my house and say, come right on in. I'd like for you to come in. Like, this is my wife. This is my daughter. And this is our beautiful salt shaker. <laughs> look at it. I mean, th- you've never seen one like this before. I mean, it's decorative. It's red, and it's got flowers on it. And, I mean, I'm telling you this is good. And somebody says, does it have salt in it? I, I really don't know. We never use it. We just like for it to look really pretty and sit right there on the table. I'll tell you, that doesn't, it doesn't make, it, that makes no sense, right? It makes about as much sense. So he didn't like the sermon. The other one was happy. He was saying, amen. This one's upset. Listen, it makes about as much sense as you saying, I'm the salt of the earth, but you never go out and salt anything. We can look pretty or handsome or whatever you say. And then, but if we never take the salt out into the world, what are we really doing? We're a salt. Verse number 14, that same thing in Matthew. You are the light of the world. We're a light. You say, well, it's getting pretty dark. That's right. The light shines better in the darkness. But it's getting darker. The light should shine brighter. You know what we try to do sometimes instead of trying to win the world? Well, listen real close. I'm almost done. We're a church. We're a church. The church is called out. Called out of what? Called out of the world. To be a light to what? The world. You know what we can't be? Listen, I, I've used this illustration several times, and I'm thankful that whenever I was dating Stacy, we'd go down to the coast, and we would go fishing. We'd go down, and we would catch some fish. And we would catch crabs. There's two different ways we caught fish and caught crabs. We caught them two different ways. Stacy's dad taught me how to throw a cast net. And I'd take a, we'd take a big net. Really, you take a small one, but you catch near as much. You'd catch a, take a big net, and you'd put it over your hand, wrap the rope a certain way, and you'd hold it. You'd grab pieces of it together and, and hoop it together, and you'd stand back, and you would throw it with a spin. And as you throw it with a spin, it'll, it'll spin out and wave out. The weights are on the bottom of it. It'll come out into a big, a big, a big swath hit the water, and the weights will take it around in the water. Then when you pull the rope, it cinches those weights underneath it. Anything that landed on, uh, on, that it landed on top of gets snagged up in it. You can catch all kinds of fish and bait and shrimp and all kinds of stuff. There was that way of fishing. You go out, and it takes some effort. You've got to throw them out. You've got to pull it up. You've got to take the stuff out, peel it out of there, put it in the buckets, and then you'd go back out and throw it out again. You'd catch all different types of stuff. It took some work. It took some effort to do that. It took some, some trying to learn, trial and error, to learn how to throw the net and go get them. The other way we used to fish is we would put stinky turkey gizzards and guts and, and turkey necks and stuff. We'd get them from the butcher shop, and you'd take it and you'd get a trap. And we would open that little top up and stick as much nasty garbage. I mean, it is nasty. It smells foul. Close that little trap and throw it out in the water with a little cork attached to the top of it, a little, a little uh, jug. 
you throw it out in the water. You know what? That was for catching crabs. And what happens is that smells so stinky in the middle of that trap, that those crabs crawl along there, and they crawl up inside that trap, smelling what's in the middle of it, that they're used to and they like. And they begin to try to eat away at that. But you know what? They, they can't ever get out. And eventually you come along and pull the traps up, and you've got a bunch of, you've got a bunch of crabs. We would have crab boils and shrimp boils. We'd catch a bunch of shrimp, catch a bunch of crabs, and eat them. There's two different ways of fishing, though. One was a net to go out and reach them. The other one was a lazy way to throw something out there and let them come to you. Now, this may not make sense to you, but it makes sense to me. Church is supposed to be more like a net than it is like a trap. What churches are doing is they take the things that the world likes, put it in the middle of the place, and hope that the world will crawl in and get trapped and not get back out. Churches have done that. They've done that over the years. They've thought, well, what does the world like? What does the world, what does the world enjoy? What would be good that the world would really like? And then let's, let's add that to the church so that people can crawl into the church and maybe they'll never crawl back out and we'll like them. But the problem is what you attract them is what you got to keep them with. The church is never meant to be a trap. The church is meant to be a net. We're meant to go out into the what? What did he say? He sent us into the what? To throw ourselves out there. And let me tell you something. You know what the net is made up of? This is so simple. You know what a net is made up of? A whole lot of strings tied together. You know what you are? When you join up here or you get involved here, you know what you are? You're another string that's been tied together to somebody else for us to use to throw out into this world to go get more and bring it in to be helped. We're supposed to be winning this world. You say, what am I left here for? You're left here. If you're saved today, you have got a purpose. The last one is this. Confound it, not conform to it. Win it, not just whine about it and throw rocks at it. The last one is this. We're left in this world. We can use it, but not misuse it. I told you there was a verse that I was going to use in Sunday school. It's in 1 Corinthians 7, 29. I know we haven't turned to a lot of these, but time is shorter, so we're, I'm telling you. I mean, if you want to copy the notes, I'll give them to you. 1 Corinthians 7, 29, it says this, but this I say, brethren, the time is short. In the context of this, he's talking about marriage, people getting married and taking care of their spouses and things like that, but this is what he said, time is short. It remaineth that both they which have wives be as though they have none, and they that weep as though they wept not, and they that rejoice as though they rejoice not, and they that buy as though they possess not. And they that use this world as not abusing it. For the fashion of this world passeth away. The fashion of this world passing away has nothing to do with you wearing fashionable clothing. I've heard people preach on that before. That's just really, really goofy. It has nothing to do with the fashionable clothing. What it has to do with the fact is this world's going to go away one day. I have no problem with you using this world. Just don't get involved in abusing it in the sense that you make the enjoyments of this world be the focus of your life. Let me tell you some things about me, and you can, you can throw rocks at me later if you want to. I love fishing. I'm a fishing fanatic. I can talk to you all day long about fishing. I know about how to fish in the bay. I know a little bit about how to fish in the uh, inland and in, in, uh, in lakes. I love, I get a kayak and I love to go fishing. I enjoy it. it. It's relaxing to me. It's fun. I love it when the, when, I, when if you're fishing in the bay, I love it when the cork goes under. We got a shrimp on there and the cork goes under and, you, and you're thinking it's on the bay. It could be anything. It could be a redfish. It could be a speckled trout. It could be a shark. It could be anything. I just have a, I have a blast. I love fishing. And let me tell you something. I don't think there's anything wrong with people fishing. Praise the Lord. I'm glad for that. I like to hunt. Not that much, as much as I like fishing, but I like to hunt. What am I saying? We were at the beach the other day, and I enjoyed the beach. I enjoy sunsets. I live on mountains. I used to love riding on a motorcycle. And then we got a daughter, and I sold it. I like motorcycles. I like cars. I even like old cars that have been fixed up. I think those are pretty cool, too. I like trucks. I've got one. I like my home. and There's nothing wrong with having a nice home. I like swimming pools. I got one that's about 14 foot around and about four foot deep. We get into it every once in a while when it gets too hot. I like sports. I like football. I used to like basketball. I like football. Now somebody's going to say, oh, I can't believe you like football. But I like football. And if you don't like it, then don't watch it. I like watching football. 
Let me say something to you, though. If I get my focus, I'm not, I, and I'm saying this, God's not opposed to these things. I'm just saying enjoy the things that God's given us to enjoy in this life and enjoy them. They're there for a reason. Enjoy it. Just please don't abuse it to the sense that you get your focus so much on those things that you lose focus on the Lord. You know what? You can have money. People, I've heard people preach against people who have money for years, and I think that's foolish. First, Timothy, First Timothy six seventeen says, "Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high minded nor trust in uncertain riches." But in the living God who giveth us, us richly all things to enjoy. You know what? If you've got money that you can spend on going on a cruise or doing something, or praise the Lord, I'm glad you get to do that. God has given us things to use in this world. But listen now, listen real close. This is the last thing I'm saying. This world, though, is not our home. So don't get so focused on those things that we lose focus on who the Lord is. We've got to keep our focus on what the Lord wants us to be and wants us to do. Last verse I'll give you is Colossians 3.1. If ye then be risen with Christ. How many of you are risen with Christ in the sense you're saved? Seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things of the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye appear with him in glory. This world's not our home. It's just passing through. Look, enjoy it. Enjoy it. Somebody was fishing the other day. I said, send me pictures of the fish you catch. I'll live vicariously through you. I'll, I'll enjoy it. I enjoy it. I, mean, I enjoy that kind of stuff. In fact, if you're going somewhere to go fishing, don't forget about me. I'll go with you. I'll, I'll, I'll have a great time along with you. I love it. I love those things. But I've got to keep my focus on the fact that this world's not my home. Somebody said this one time, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. So, folks, we've been left here for a reason. He left them here. He left us here. We're not supposed to, we're supposed to confound it, not conform to it. We're supposed to win it, not whine about it. We can use it. Just don't abuse it or misuse it. Keep your focus on the Lord Jesus Christ. Keep your focus on being a witness for somebody else. I made sure today when we were before church, I made sure there was gospel tracts sitting out there, tons of them. Here's what I want you to do. Take a gospel track. If you go eat somewhere today, give it to the, the waitress. Say, well, that's, that's just outside of my bubble. That's outside of my of my comfort zone, you've been left here for a purpose. Be a witness. Give one to your neighbor. Invite him to church. Try to be a gospel witness to somebody. That's what you've been left here for. Let's stand. Lord God, Father, thank you for coming into this world and doing what you did to save us from the wrath to come and make a way. Father, thank you for giving us clear guidance that that's what we've been left here for. It's not just for the preacher or the pastors, or the, but for all of us to be a witness. doesn't matter what we're doing or where we're doing it at. We've been left here to be a witness. Lord, help us to keep our focus while we, while we work, while we play, while we do the things we're doing every single day we're doing it. Help us to keep our mind focused on the fact that we're doing it as a witness for you. Help us keep our focus on you. Lord, there's a day coming when we're going to stand before you and have to give an account of what we did with the life you gave us, and I pray you'd help us to do that. Our Father, if somebody doesn't know you as your Savior, I pray they'd get saved before it's everlasting too late this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, she's going to play. Give you a chance to come pray this morning. If you need to do anything this morning, you can come do it. You need to join the church or talk to me or pray about something. Whatever you need, this is your time.